Well, thank you all for braving the weather, coming out, spending some time with me this afternoon to uh, learn all about the Cape Cod Canal. I see new faces, I see familiar faces. I know some of you know a lot about the Cape Cod Canal already. And for some, it might be a brand new ditch to you. Um, so today's presentation is really going to be a little bit of everything about the Cape Cod Canal. So we're going to touch on the history. We're also going to touch on modern day operations. So you'll get a little bit of everything. Um, I am a park ranger with the US Army Corps of Engineers. I've been working for the US Army Corps of Engineers for 20, more than 25 years. So. <laughs> For, for a while now. Um, my main job at the Cape Cod Canal is to lead our interpretive services and outreach program. So that's all of our educational components. I spend a lot of time at our visitor center, which I'll tell you more about later. Uh, great place to come and visit with family and friends. It's free and it's all things Cape Cod Canal. So I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, but without further ado, um, we're going to get right into the Cape Cod Canal, but I'd like to at least mention who I work for, which is the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They are the agency that operates and maintains the waterway, and we are your nation's engineering organization. Our agency has been around since the Revolutionary War. As a matter of fact, our first engineering action was right here in Massachusetts, and it was to build a fortification at Breeds Hill. So we do date back to 1775. Um, we at the Cape Cod Canal are all civilians, however. We are not military. And that shift really started in the 1800s as our country was growing and expanding. Our country needed engineers to help us do that. And many of them were military engineers coming out of West Point. So Congress started authorizing military engineers to do civil works. And from that time in the early 1800s, our, our agency has really grown and expanded. We have about 35,000 civilians that work for our agency. And we do a lot of engineering. I'm not going over all that, but I can whittle it down <clears throat> and say that if it has to do with enhancing our economy, enhancing our security, helping us prevent, prepare for, respond to a disaster of some sort, uh, specifically now we're uh, responding to, um, to, the, to uh, the, the bridge that had uh, collapsed with the ship strike, um, our agency is involved with that. Our agency is heavily involved in engineering and our nation's waterways, whether it's to reduce the risk of flooding, or in the case of the Cape Cod Canal, it has all to do about transportation. You know, it's kind of funny, when you mention transportation, we talk about transportation infrastructure, what comes to mind? Roads, bridges, rail, airports. How many of you think navigable waterway? Few of you, you do, yes. <laughs> so I have, I have some, some, some in my camp. Um, but majority don't think of it right away. But if you think about your lives, think about what's in your lives, what you wear, what's in your home, what you drive, the fuel that makes it go, the majority of it floats at some point to get to you. Because it's the most efficient way to move big, heavy stuff. That's floating all around the world, and it's also floating here in the United States. There's about 25,000 miles worth of navigable waterways. Our agency's involved in maintaining a good portion of that, including our Cape Cod Canal in our backyard. So the Cape Cod Canal is a 17.4 mile piece of this 25,000 mile network of moving stuff around our country. The 17.4 miles, well, let's start with the first bullet point. It is a sea level canal. So what I mean by that, it does not have locks like the Panama Canal has, like the Erie Canal has. There is nothing controlling the movement of the water or nothing that people have designed to control the movement. The moon controls the movement. It's all about the tides. So we have our high tides, we have our low tides, and we have resulting current from those tides. Can I guess many of you have spent some time along the Cape Cod Canal? Yep. Have any of you taken a boat through the Cape Cod Canal? Oh, a lot of you. Excellent. Um, I hope you planned your trip, right? Did you look at a tide table? More specifically, what is the current doing? The Cape Cod Canal is interesting because it is a human-made ditch that connects two bays that experience different tides. So the Cape Cod Bay, I mean, you have Cape Cod Bay here on the northeast end and Buzzards Bay down on this end. 
the tidal range, Cape Cod Bay, is about nine and a half feet on average. In Buzzards Bay, on the end that we're closest to now, it's less than four feet on average. And when it's high tide and low tide, it's off by a couple of hours. So the bays are doing this. And what does the current do? Well, it always flows downhill. So depending on which, which side is higher at the moment, the current basically seesaws back and forth roughly every six hours. So we have a sea level canal. It's doing whatever the sea is doing. And, um, and we, we can see that. The total length of the Cape Cod Canal is 17.4 miles long. You have not biked 17.4 miles, even though it might feel like that with the wind, right? <laughs> All right, so the land cut, the area between Scusset Beach and the Maritime Academy is eight miles. The service road on this side of the canal is six and a half miles. It's seven miles on the mainland side. So where does the rest of the canal come into play? It's mostly in approach channels. About nine miles of approach channel extends into Buzzards Bay all the way down to Cleveland Ledge Light, which is down here off of Old Silver Beach. And it also extends a little bit out into Cape Cod Bay. And the reason why that's part of the Cape Cod Canal project is because we want to guarantee water that's at least 32 feet deep by 480 feet wide for two-way passage of the large ships that use it. Why is it here? Well, one reason, it's a great shortcut. So it provides this economic benefit because it saves time, fuel, and money. It saves an average of 135 miles of coastal travel between um, ports like New York and Boston. Oh, I'm sorry, C and D Canal does exist. I, I didn't mean to eliminate it. All right, we're not the only canal on the East Coast. All right, so shortcut is one reason why we have a Cape Cod Canal here. This is another big reason why a Cape Cod Canal exists in this location. Has anyone ever seen this image before? Quite a few of you. So for those that haven't, you, you know, of course, have Cape Cod. There's Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Plymouth is here. And then you have all those little specks along the outer shores of the Cape. Those are all individual marine disasters, shipwrecks. This one drawing, I think it's from 1904, shows 1,076 marine disasters, and that's not all of them. Historians estimate as many as 3,000 shipwrecks from the early colonial days to the early 1900s. So digging a canal through here would help prevent that hardship. And this was not only a great location to avoid the dangerous outer shores of Cape Cod, Nature was kind of already hinting, like, this is a good spot to cut through. Because in this valley, which is only eight miles long, we're already two rivers flowing through it. If the Cape Cod Canal was con not constructed, you, we would right now be near the banks of the Monument River. And if you lived, uh, live on the mainland side and you were coming here, you would cross that river over Old Bridge the old stone bridge that was there. So today it's Old Bridge Road. On this side, it's Keene Street. This is where this bridge would cross that river. And so you would walk across, maybe take a horse or your, your cart across to, uh, to come to this presentation. Um, so yeah, what was here? You had the Monument River, Tidal River, connecting to the Herring River, or more of a Herring Stream, which was fresh water coming out of Great Herring Pond. And then on the northeast end, where Cape Cod Bay is, an extensive salt marsh with various tidal creeks meandering about. The longest one was the Scusset River, and at high tide, it made it to about where the Sagamore Bridge is. So if you can imagine, roughly between the Herring Run and the Sagamore Bridge, that was your dry land, no more than 30 feet above sea level. So how did it get from, how did we get from this to the Cape Cod Canal that we see today? Well, I'm going to show you part of our film that we show at our visitor center called Canal Story, and that's going to take you through that story. And then I'm going to stop the film at a point as we start pivoting towards modern day, and we'll get back into the slides to talk about modern day along the Cape Cod Canal. So um, let's see if this works. You ready?
The story of the Cape Cod Peninsula began some 10,000 years ago during the Great Ice Age. When the glacier began to melt and retreat, it deposited the soil and rocks it had transported from northern New England. On Cape Cod, many kettle ponds and streams were formed, including the tidal rivers that meandered along the valley in which the Cape Cod Canal now flows. All that separated Cape Cod from the rest of Massachusetts was a narrow strip of land. It was Captain Miles Standish of the Plymouth Colony who first envisioned a canal through this glacial valley. It would provide an inland waterway route to engage in trade with the Dutch and the local Wampanoag Indian tribe. But building a canal was far beyond the means of a small colony of pilgrims. The idea of a canal, however, was to excite many others over the next three centuries. Meanwhile, the treacherous shoals of Cape Cod stranded many a ship in the 300 years of marine commerce which preceded the completion of the canal in the early years of this century. The deadly shifting sands of the great outer beach claimed nearly a wreck a week at the height of the commercial shipping era from 1880 to 1900. Without the courageous work of the U.S. Life-Saving Service, many more lives would have been lost. Despite the obvious need for a canal, there were many plans, but few real attempts. There were isolated attempts, but no success. As hopes dimmed, a wealthy financier from New York City, August Perry Belmont, formed the Boston Cape Cod and New York Canal Company in 1904. He promised not to stop until the last shovelful was dug. Belmont hired an experienced chief engineer, William Barclay Parsons, who had recently worked on the Panama Canal. In 1909, construction began. With granite from Maine, a breakwater was constructed at the east end on Cape Cod Bay. The first dredge on the job, the Nahant, reopened the ditch from an earlier attempt, and the construction of the Cape Cod Canal began in earnest. unforeseen problems, however, such as 100-ton boulders left by the glacier. Parsons had divers place dynamite charges to eliminate these huge roadblocks. Running behind schedule, Parsons then decided to supplement the dredge work with steam shovels and narrow gauge railroad cars to dig in the midsection. working from either end towards the middle, progress picked up once again. Construction of the railroad bridge and two highway drawbridges began in 1911. 
the townspeople of Bourne and Sandwich began trading cynical looks with ones of hope. Maybe this canal really would be built. separated the waters of the two bays. August Belmont and his elated chief engineer Parsons shook hands at this last dike. And when the waters poured through and mixed for the first time in history, Cape Cod became an island and the Cape Cod Canal became reality. The grand opening, July 29, 1914, was grand indeed. Many dignitaries, including the young Franklin Delano Roosevelt, were there. Belmont's canal was a toll waterway, and he had hoped to turn a profit from the many schooner barges carrying the fuel of the day, coal. passenger ships of the Eastern Steamship Line were a common sight to the many folks who would line the banks of the canal to hail the great ships through. Tricky tidal currents were made fierce by the narrow 20-foot deep channel, and after a few serious mishaps, ship owners once again were taking the outer route around the Cape. Belmont's canal was a financial failure. The United States government purchased the Foundering Canal on March 30, 1928. Under the direction of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, a massive reconstruction project began. eliminated and it was determined that to facilitate commerce the canal would remain open to vessel traffic during the reconstruction. It was the time of the Great Depression.
nearly 1,300 jobs were created throughout the project. To make ship traffic truly safe, the approach channel was straightened through Buzzards Bay. Dikes built from dredged material were created to control the currents, thereby allowing a direct approach to the land cut. To eliminate the conflicts between marine and vehicular traffic caused by Belmont's drawbridges, new elevated highway bridges were built. Vertical lift railroad bridge replaced Belmont's original drawbridge. With a center span of 544 feet, the new railroad bridge was the longest in the world when built and is still one of the longest ever constructed. The waterway was expanded to nearly 500 feet wide and 32 feet deep, removing 30 million cubic yards of earth. Riprap stone was placed on canal banks to decrease the effects of wave wash. By 1940, the world's widest sea level canal was completed. All right, and I'm gonna pause it right there and slide back into our PowerPoint. All right. So the film ended with the Cape Cod Canal being the widest sea level in the uh, sea level canal in the world when completed. And it was, but it's no longer. Trivia. Uh, oh, Mr. Mattingly, you didn't know the answer. You can't. You can't. All right. Who else uh, knows besides you two as well? Uh, what is the world's widest sea level canal today? Yeah. You got it, 100%. So uh, over the, congratulations, I wish I had a prize. Uh, so over the last few decades, uh, the, the Suez Canal has expanded in every way and is the widest sea level canal. Um, so the film started to transition into modern day operations. What do we have for boats going through the canal? And since that film that we put together is uh, more than 20 years old, it's not so modern anymore. So I figured I'd come back to the slides. Um, Today, what do we have? We have a whole variety of boats, ships, and barges that go through the Cape Cod Canal. We use an estimate of 15,000 vessels, and I'm gonna say that's an estimate because we don't keep hard numbers of every single boat that goes through the canal. We keep hard numbers of every vessel 65 feet in length or longer, and we have roughly 6,000 of those that go through every year. The rest are small pleasure, pleasure craft that come through or anything under 65 feet. So it could be fishing boats uh, and other work boats as well. But it's only the larger vessels that we keep hard numbers at. So that's why I say approximately 15,000. But again, that's an estimate. Um, of the larger commercial vessels going through, there's about 6 million tons of cargo that went through the Cape Cod Canal last year. Um, by far, the number one type of cargo is some sort of petroleum. And by far, the most common way to see go through the Cape Cod Canal is on a tug and barge unit, just like the central photograph there. So if all of you live locally, can I guess you've all seen a vessel like this go through the canal? Uh, it looks like a tanker, but really it is two separate uh, vessels. They're kind of like the tractor trailers of the sea. And that the barge is like the trailer, it holds the product. And then the tugboat is like the truck part. It's either gonna push it or pull it to its destination. Um, these units all have V-notched sterns in the, in the barges, so the bow of the tug can pin right into place and um, perform much like a ship, even though they're two separate vessels. Uh, by far, probably some of the larger vessels that go through, besides oil tankers, would be cruise ships and car carriers. Have any of you seen a car carrier go through the canal? Yeah, huge, huge is right. And silence, oddly silent. So when a tug comes through the canal pushing a barge, you can feel the strength of that engine. You kind of feel the vibration and hear it almost before you see it. The car carriers are just quiet. 
You know, so especially if you're along the canal at night and you just see the lights along the canal being slowly eclipsed by this giant vessel. <laughs> and yeah, that's what it is. And for those that haven't seen it, imagine a parking garage with 5,000 spots and have that float by you. That's how big they are. All right, so how do we make sure all these vessels go through safely? Because of course that's been in the news lately, so how do we do this? Uh, first way is making sure the canal's as big as we say it is. So we routinely survey uh, the Cape Cod Canal. So little, little unassuming boats go out with side scan sonar. They send down sound waves that bounce back and tell us how deep the canal is that goes in the software. And then we have pretty pictures that shows, oh no, we have a shoal or a sandbar across the channel. And when that happens, this is uh, roughly every 10 years or so, we will uh, contract out to have a dredge come in, which is a, a boat that digs. Uh, the dredges that we use are generally hydraulic dredges, so they have an arm that goes down very much like a vacuum cleaner, sucks up the sand, fills the hopper right in over there. And then um, when that vessel is full, the last two times we did it, which was uh, in the winter of 2016 and again this past winter, uh, when the vessel's full, it heads out the east end of the canal into Cape Cod Bay, parks about a half mile offshore, connects to a pipe, and then puts the sand back onto Town Neck Beach. So we're removing sand from where we don't want it and put it where it's needed. Um, this upcoming winter, we should see more dredging happening, but not in the navigation channel. Uh, a study was done that uh, freed up some funding to help alleviate some of the erosion problems that are happening here as a result of the jetties that are here. And with this project coming up, um, it, it looks like it's going to go, you know, it's everything from all of your permitting, all your planning, all your funding. What would happen is the dredge would work from a borrow site over here where there's extra sand and then pipe it to where it's needed here. And so that's expected to happen this upcoming winter and that will take another 300 to 400,000 cubic yards of material from here and put it in select locations over here. So stay tuned for that. It's pretty impressive to see um, when it does happen. All right, the other way we help make sure vessels are safe is by watching everybody and directing all the large uh, traffic through. So some of my coworkers are marine traffic controllers. They operate a marine traffic control system. Um, the center is located on Academy Drive in Buzzards Bay. So our, this is a 24 hour a day facility. We have people that are watching every vessel on radar and on camera and also using something called AIS, an automatic identification system. With that, the vessels themselves are pinging out who they are and where they are and other data. And then we're receiving that information and it's being displayed on an electronic navigation chart. So any controller starting their eight hour shift could come in Look at that, point, click, draw lines, get estimated times of what vessels they will see over their next eight hour shift. And this is great too, because if you have vessels that are um, multiple vessels that wanna come at the same time, we could coordinate where they're gonna pass. We can have certain vessels speed up or slow down so they pass in the right spot. If a vessel is so big that they need a one way down the middle, we can coordinate, coordinate that well in advance too. Some vessels are so big that they are tide dependent on when they can come through. Say, for instance, that car carrier. Depending on how much it is loaded will determine how low it sits in the water or how high it sits out of the water. We want at least four feet of air above the vessel and at least four feet of water below the vessel. And sometimes those vessels are so big that they are tide dependent on when they'll meet that criteria. So all that is calculated and coordinated. Another thing they have to calculate and coordinate is the movement of that train bridge. And so if the train bridge were to lower, what will happen is first the controller will make sure that there's no large traffic in the waterway. And then they'll send out one of our patrol boats upstream you know, it depends on which way the current is going at that time, to make sure small boats don't get too close to it. And when everything is clear, our controllers will give the okay to the bridge operator to lower that. Now, there are all sorts of trains that use our, uh, our bridge. Some are hauling trash, some are hauling people. The people, the trash, they don't mind waiting. So if they show up 
and uh, there's something large, like a large vessel already in the water, uh, then they might have to sit and wait a half hour or so until the vessel passes and then the bridge lowers. For passenger trains, all that is coordinated ahead of time. So our controllers won't let commit anything large in the land cut of the canal if a passenger train is coming. Yeah. I just recently found out that that railroad bridge does mm -hmm. not have a controller 24-7 through the winter. No, well, there's n there's not somebody on there 24 seven year round. So you have your set staff. So my coworkers are you know assigned there. You know their 40 hour a week shifts to do basic movement to do the movements during those shifts, but also to do all the day to day maintenance that's necessary. Additionally, some of our other team members who might be a part of our electronics crew or electricians, so we have a team of other people that will fill other shifts, so we, ha we can have coverage when it's needed for a bridge well, movement, so if it's on a Sunday night. I was my dog a couple of weeks ago, and two trains were waiting mm -hmm. down on Bell Road, and I was waiting because I want to take a mm -hmm. My great nephew, and then I decided to continue to walk, and I walked and came back, and they were still waiting. And somebody from the Corps of Engineers, or somebody, I think it was for the train, it was the train company, was in a truck there. So I spoke to him, and he said that they were waiting for them, someone to arrive to load the bridge for him. Oh, so maybe it was an unscheduled train. But, uh, yeah, so I yeah, it was yeah. So if anything that's scheduled, we'll have we'll have staff on for that. Yeah. So. I don't know. But our boat operators will go out. That's another sign that the bridge is going to lower. If they'll, they might go out and make sure the, the traffic is clear. And these boat operators also serve kind of as the eyes for the marine traffic controller when the equipment can't see certain things clearly. One of those things are North Atlantic right whales. So North Atlantic right whales are critically endangered. They feed out in Cape Cod Bay this time of year, you know, winter into early spring. Sometimes they're following their stomachs and sometimes that takes them right into the Cape Cod Canal. Uh, we are part of that network and we'll get word when they do um, get close to or inside the navigation channel. And in a case like this, this was in March of last year. There were five right at the entrance of the canal in Cape Cod Bay. So our patrol boats are not telling them to go anywhere. They're just keeping eyes on them um, to let the marine traffic controller know. Because um, in a case like this, we close the canal to all shipping until we know the coast is clear. Um, and so they'll be doing that. And then, then throughout the season, you might see them active, trying to render assistance to vessels in need. They're out enforcing rules and regulations, like when you decide to stop and cast your fishing pole in the middle of the channel. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to keep going when you're, when you're in the canal. Um, yeah, so we have those, that's, uh, my team of uh, boat operators. We have, we have about 50 full-time employees at the canal. So who do you see? You might see the patrol boat operators out, um, and you see the park rangers. But w we have a whole, slew, whole team of, of high-voltage electricians. You know, the canal is open 24-7. So the canal is lit, you know, throughout the night. If you're a vessel going through the canal, you, every 500 feet is a pole, a light pole. And those are not just there to mark your favorite fishing spot. They, <laughs> they are there to light the way. Uh, for vessels uh, moving through. Our bridges are lit, including that aerial photograph, uh, I mean that aerial light that Rich is uh, replacing right up there. You want to know who replaces the flag when it gets tattered on the railroad bridge? Rich. Yeah. So I mean there's others that do. So it's a special breed of people that are not afraid to be over 200 feet above the water and think nothing of it. Yeah. Yeah, so he tells me, he's like, it's Sam, it's like, it's like walking across a sidewalk. Do you worry about falling off a sidewalk? I'm like, no, but I have. <laughs> and, and anyway, they're, they're, all, they're all safe with their harnesses. And, so, and then we, you know, we have a crew of people who maintains those picnic benches and the tables. So it's a full suite of, of employees and volunteers that, that help us maintain the canal. And we do have <clears throat> two people that are specifically assigned to the railroad bridge and its operations. Their office is right there. That's on the mainland side in Buzzards Bay. Uh, has everyone seen this bridge move? 
Yeah, just about, okay. So it moves about 1,100 times a year. Um, if you wanna see it move, um, and you wanna bring someone to see it move, in the winter time, it's hard to give you an exact date because the trash trains, they don't give us a set time. They just say, oh, we'll be there sometime in the next four hours. But the passenger trains, you know, when they're operating, say Memorial Day to Labor Day, if you look on their websites for the Cape Flyer or the Cape Train and get their times, then that's your best bet. You know, if you want to bring someone down to see that, see it operate. I love this bridge. Uh, functionally, it is phenomenal in, I mean, it was completed in 1935, still used today. Um, it is very efficient in its movement. This center span is 2,200 tons. It takes less than a dollar in electricity for a round trip move mm -hmm. to get this to move. And a lot of it has to do with its counterweights. So, you know, you have these big boxes right here. There's a concrete filled steel. You can add concrete or take it out as you need to, say when there's ice accumulation in the winter on the span. Um, but they're connected by cables. And in those rooms up top are giant pulleys called shivs. And when they, we have like, I think it's a 200 or 220 horsepower engine that as soon as that, that starts, it, it will move the pulleys and then the span will lower and the counterweights will rise. It takes about two and a half minutes for it to get in position for the train. You've got a giant bird in that photo. <laughs> Where's my, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perspective, right? It's, a, it's our giant goal, that's right. Is, uh, is there any other train in the country, train bridge in the country like that? There is. There are other bridges in the, these are called vertical lift bridges. There are plenty in the country and the world. Few that are this big. There's a couple that are bigger. Uh, there's, I think, one between Staten Island and New Jersey and another one between New Jersey and Delaware that beat us by a few feet. Um, I think the C and D Canal, Chesapeake Delaware Canal might have one. They don't, they're not as pretty. None of them are as pretty as ours. None. Uh, so the cone, the cone work on top, the stainless steel spheres, the scrolling floor de lis, you know, as you like, you know, if you're on the train and you're coming into the approach, those are all extra architectural elements that set our bridge apart from any of the others. The others are purely functional. None are as pretty as ours. So. So who cares if they're bigger? <laughs> All right, bridges, if I don't say it, you're going to ask me. So here's what we got. We have the Bourne and the Sagmore Bridge, also completed in 1935. Lots of people cross over them. The US Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for maintaining them. And so um, what, overnight, was it overnight? Uh, overnight on Monday night, um, there was some repair work along the roadway. Um, we have engineers that are part of a team that will inspect every square inch of those bridges. They get the head-to-toe inspection once every two years. If something pops up and they need to go out and inspect it again, they will. And maintenance is based on that. And of course, bridges being as old as they are, there's plenty of maintenance that happens. So from those routine inspections, from just what is recommended routine maintenance, we're out there, whether we're working on the roadway, the paint, the pavement, the expansion joints, those, those bridges are designed to flex, uh, to expand and contract. And so there are special joints along the way to allow them to do that. Uh, the lighting, the electrical all goes through there. It needs upgrades. We're doing all this work um, throughout the time. Um, and have been doing it since the beginning. Though in the past, there were not as many people that lived around here. There was a set slow period, a set time where there wasn't a lot of traffic. So you would, in big projects, just close the bridge and detour people to the other bridge. Can you imagine that today? No, <laughs> definitely not. So that's not what happens today. So what in 2023, we created uh, good traffic backups on the Sagamore in the spring and the Bourne in the fall. Um, we have, we're doing concrete work. And some of that concrete work is not just below um, the bridge or below the decking, it's below actually the roadway. And so here, you know, the concrete structures that are the bookends of the, connect, of the bridges are called the abutments. Here we had to scrape down the roadway to get to the concrete to do the repairs, to then put back uh, the concrete, uh, put back the weatherproofing, and then the roadway, and then paint it, and then move on. 
And now all of our work that we do, we have to think about completing it in thirds. Our lanes are narrow, but they're 10 feet wide, fine in 1935 when the bridges were constructed, not fine now. Um, and so for us to take a lane, really what we do is we take a little bit more than a lane for work and then leave one lane heading off Cape, one lane heading, sorry, one lane heading on Cape, one lane heading off Cape. And, um, and obviously that creates some, some traffic backups. But this is how we need to execute work now. Now, are we going to keep doing this? Well, that was what the big study was all about because once every 50 years or so, the maintenance is not little, the maintenance is big. Was anyone around here when this job was done? A few of you were? Yeah, all right, so this is called a major rehabilitation. Um, this is where the entire roadway and decking were removed and the bridge was brought down to its stringers and beams and different repairs were done on those and then everything was put back. So you can make a bridge live forever if you just keep doing major repairs like that. So roughly every 50 years is the recommendation to do that. Well, we're, we're coming up on that. And so an engineering study was completed called a major rehabilitation evaluation study because this is such a big project that was going to take many years, cost lots of money. With this study, are we going to really do another major rehab or are we going to replace it? And that study, which was um, issued uh, or signed off in 2020, uh, was the engineering study we needed to say it's time to replace the bridges. So it's really from there that the authorization to replace the bridges came. Since 2020, a lot has happened. Um, the US Army Corps of Engineers has formed a partnership with the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, who was simultaneously doing their own engineering study on all of the surrounding roads to improve them for multimodal uh, transportation. Didn't make sense for us to build a bridge and for the state to improve all the roads around and have them not in sync. So with this, the state is now the lead on everything. Partnership, we're still in partnership with them and so is Federal Highways Administration. Now, since 2020, since this partnership has happened, what now? Of course, everyone wants to know, you know, what are the new bridges going to look like? Where are they going to go? When will they be built? What about the roads around it? How much is everything going to cost? Just things are still being worked out. Progress has been made if you've been following it and how best to follow it. Um, go to mass.gov slash Bridges website. Any photograph or image I have projecting what the bridges are going to look like in the future, where are they going to go, I got from this website. This is how I stay up to date. Um, so you can get your latest updates, um, your background if you're into engineering studies and want to read the state study and the Corps of Engineers study, it's available there. But outreach, the, from there, you can see what the latest presentations were and then you can sign up for email updates and so when they have their next public outreach you get an alert and you can be there um, they also ask for uh, feedback public feedback on things so if you have an idea you want your voice heard um, send it there you can tell me but it's not going to go anywhere <laughs> um, so so this is where I get this and then a lot of other information I, st I, I, I just pay attention to some of our local news outlets who have been really good in, in covering it as well uh, now to pivot towards what I know more about is other stuff happening along the canal besides the navigation mission we have stewardship missions and recreation missions at the Cape Cod Canal and this is where I fall in as a park ranger there is 1153 acres of federal land that surrounds the Cape Cod Canal we have a team of nine natural resource specialists or park rangers along the canal we have a, a cadre of volunteers and partners we work with um, and we have some seasonal staff that help us um, whether we're maintaining habitats we are working on uh, removing invasives or protecting endangered species uh, we are working on our resources both natural and cultural along the canal and we're also working to provide safe recreational opportunities along the canal. And I think that's how most of us know the canal, right? Is, is the recreation that we do along the waterway. Probably the biggest draw are what 
the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers calls surface roads because those are our navigation service roads to maintain the infrastructure. They're just open to the public. So there's 13 miles when you, uh, 13 and a half miles when you add both sides together of paved waterside service roads that are open for the public to walk, bike, roller skate on. Um, we have multiple day use areas with picnic tables. The access points where all the parking areas are, restrooms, those will reopen for the season on April 20th. Um, from there, and then you can access for some great uh, shoreline fishing. We lease out property for campgrounds along the canal, so Bourne Scenic Park and Scusset Beach are both on federal lands, but the other, those agencies, uh, Bourne Recreation Authority and DCR, manage those facilities. And then um, park rangers will offer a whole variety of uh, interpretive programming along the canal. And this is kind of my bread and butter. May through October, you can find me at the Cape Cod Canal Visitor Center. If you haven't been before, please come visit me. This is a free museum. We took over a circa 1937 Coast Guard boathouse and turned it into a museum about the Cape Cod Canal. We have lots of uh, hands-on activities. Um, we, we touch on both the history, the operation, the natural, the engineered. And it's waterfront, so you never know what you're going to see go by. Is that the sandwich? That's on the sandwich end, so really close to the sandwich marina. You got it. You got it. And, and you'll see me pointing at things if you come down and visit. Uh, for our hours of operation, for the programs we're going to offer, for more about events we're going to host, like our next event is on the day we reopen the restrooms. Uh, for Earth Day weekend, we're partnering with uh, AmeriCorps Cape Cod to do our 23rd annual canal cleanup, and that will be at the Herring Run. But for all that, check out our Facebook page. I know a lot of you heard about the presentation today on Facebook. So Cape Cod Canal Visitor Center, we have our Facebook page, all things Cape Cod Canal on that. And then if you just want a little bit more on the background of the canal, some copies of brochures, uh, a little more on the history and the features, you can um, get to our website, which is a really long URL. So if you just type in capecodcanal.us, it will take you there. Yes. We talked one time about making a special um, path uh, on the canal for the bicycles, to, separate from the people walking. Is that anything that's going to come up now? I haven't heard of that. Not the, the U.S. It wasn't a the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So first, for us, we need to maintain that road as a service road to maintain the navigation infrastructure. We're mandated to do that. And so we're working on ways to, to, um, to improve um, uh, visitor safety while along those service roads, because we have a lot of people using it, a lot of different people of different abilities, and, and trying to get everyone to share the road and play nice is really uh, what we'll be working on. I know <laughs> it's a challenge, but uh, we're kind of all in it together. So, so that's you know, where we're going to need to go with that. Um, with that, are there any other questions or stories that people want to share? Yeah. I'm under the impression that originally the canal was supposed to go through Back River. And the, Excellent. Uh, canal infrastructure underwater there. So, so this was a mention about the a canal, a Cape Cod canal going through the Back River. So, if you. Look at, do I, let me see if I have a map really quick. I do. Let me go back to this. One right over here. Okay, so this is where the Cape Cod Canal flows now, kind of roughly like this. This is the back river in over here. There have been a lot of different proposals for a Cape Cod Canal in this location. First engineering study, we're going back to the Revolutionary War. 1776 was the first, and there were loads throughout the 1800s. Going up the back river and then connecting this way was, was something that was favored for quite some time. And that's because of this island right here being in the way of having a straight approach. This island is called Hog Island. 
Uh, it is now only a fraction of its size and it's connected to Mashney Island. Um, and the canal comes straight through this way. But there was talk about this because it'd be easier to come in behind the islands. As a matter of fact, Belmont's Canal, when the Cape Cod Canal first opened, it came up Finney's Harbor behind Mashney Island and Hog Island and then turned left and then turned right. So if you drive out to Mashney Island today and you look towards the right and towards the left and see rock piles, covered in cormorant droppings. Uh, <laughs> those are the markers for where the turns happened in the original canal. You should explain that about the Mashney Causeway. Oh, so, so now these islands are connected. During the 1930s, the Cape Cod Canal was, you know, expanded, it was widened, it was deepened, the drawbridges were replaced with their current bridges, and this whole configuration in Buzzards Bay changed. Um, there were reports from Belmont's Canal that this was a problem. And so at that time, you know, there's heavier equipment in the 30s, it was easier to basically cut Hog Island in half, use dredge material to connect these two islands. And then out here, if you uh, look at a, a navigation map, you'll see Stony Point Dyke extending out this way. That was also constructed with dredge spoil. So this right here, and then those two bumps are islands, and all those were connected with dredge spoil in the 1930s to allow for a straight approach into the land cut. Now, these two options for a canal through the Back River or coming up the Monument River were only a couple of options for a Cape Cod Canal in the, 18, in the 1820s when the United States was building canals everywhere. There was a survey done in our region for canals and multiple options came up. Coming up through the Bass River was an option. Going through Orleans was an option. Technically, that was the first Cape Cod Canal because there was a little ditch that came in from Rock Harbor and came out. Is that, what is that, Pleasant, Pleasant Bay? What is it on, uh, near Salt Pond Visitor Center? Oh, down Cape. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, no, uh, in East Ham, in East Ham. So there was a little ditch that you can float over um, in high tide, like Foley during the... Foley uh, Foley no, Jeremiah's gutter. Oh, yeah, Jeremiah's yeah. gutter. <laughs> um, so that was in the, uh, that was an option. There was even an, an, a thought about building a canal coming up the Taunton River and coming out at Quincy. So there were a lot of options explored. This one was the most explored and obviously won out. Yeah. Was the railroad put in at the exact same time as the canal or was there a pre-existing railroad going mm. down Cape Cod? Yeah, good question. So the railroad arrived before uh, the Cape Cod Canal did. I think 1848 is when the Cape Cod Canal arrived here. Of course, I'm being recorded, so I might be wrong. You'll have to check it. So I think it was 1848. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, that dry area between the two rivers, that was the village of Borndale. There was a train station right where the Cape Cod Canal exists. So all of that track had to be relocated during the canal's construction. Yeah. Does the Corps still have own equipment, heavy equipment that they utilize? Or? For dredging the canal? For dredging or even, they, they used to do road work too, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, we have, you know, um, we have some, um, some equipment for doing some basic maintenance, but anything really major, we would contract that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, are there any plans to add any more benches or trees or things like that along either side? More benches or what? Trees. Or trees? Um, at this year, I don't think we have anything in the pipeline, but that does not mean that more are not happening uh, at different recreation areas. So, yeah, for more shade and more places to sit. Yeah, we're constantly, you know, uh, looking at the resources that we have and, and, and looking to maintain what we have and improve what we have. But I don't know of a plan specific for this season. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned all the lights. Um, how are they uh, powered? Is it solar power? Is there a solar power there, system along the canal? There is not. So it's all, we're fed in from the grid and uh, to a substation and distributed from there. Um, we, 
was it maybe six years ago, I'm losing track of time now, converted everything to LED uh, to save, but um, right now it's whatever the power from the grid is. We are not uh, self-sustaining. We don't generate our own electricity. Do they offer any tours of the um, traffic um, control center? We don't offer public tours of the control center. That stopped uh, September 11th. Yeah, that was, um, that was probably the last summer um, of 2001 that, that we offered that. So what we do do at the visitor center and some of the exhibits there, um, we live stream um, like the camera and the radar from the control center and we do tours there. Yeah. 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 Where do your pilots come out of? The pilots are a third party. Um, they are, the company is called Northeast Pilots and we can see them at the Sandwich Marina and but where they come on and go off depends on which direction the vessel is going so if they're heading towards Cape Cod Bay they're getting off there and you know if they're heading towards Buzzard Bay then they'd be getting on so um, so they might come out of Newport you know if they're taking a large vessel up all you know all of Buzzards Bay and the canal and then get off you know um, a pilot boat will come out of the marina and sandwich the movie uh, talks a little bit about the lifesavers, uh, where, where they had saved uh, lots and lots of lives um, down in the Lower Cape, mm -hmm. what being one of the reasons why the canal was built. And one of the really great things that is on the Cape nowadays is the life-saving station down in Provincetown. And on Thursday nights, they have a recre recreation of the life-saving uh, program. And have you, as the director at the... Um, a visitor center thought about having some sort of joint programming with them because it would slide right into your mm. mission. So I, on your recommendation, I actually did make it out. If you oh, have you not did. been to the National Seashore uh, Race Point, they have a life-saving uh, station and they do a reenactment of, of of um, launching the breaches buoy. So if you don't know what that is, basically if a vessel were to wreck, um, members of the life-saving service basically had two options to try to save people. You either go out on a surf boat to get people off, or you take a little mini cannon uh, called a Lyle gun and shoot a line out towards it, and then with block and tackle, basically send out what looks like a life ring and a pair of shorts, and you are rescuing one person at a time, and they do a demo of that um, in the summer, and you said it was, it was Thursday nights or something. Thursday nights. Yeah, so Thursday definitely nights. worth checking out the National Parks website, and um, that's through their, his, there's a historical society does that, and so I don't know if they would have the capability to come to us and, and, and the resources. It just but seems like really cool. the two just go together. They do. The canal mm -hmm. and the life saving yep. service. Yeah. I guess it doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes. Is there any affiliation with the Mass Maritime? Do the kids get any uh, experience on the canal? Or um, we we are neighbors with the kids, and sometimes we hire them. Um, and but there's no formal partnership or affiliation in, in that respect. Just based on kind of what their schedules and needs are and ours. It's, it's kind of, it's been hard for that, but I know that we um, will have at least one seasonal hire that's uh, from the Maritime Academy this year. Mm -hmm. I, I know you mentioned the right whales. Did, do they actually, have they ever transited the canal? The whales, do they go through them? Um, North Atlantic right whales, I, I'm trying to think, if, I don't know if I know if that species coming all the way through but humpbacks we've seen go all the way through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you know, North Atlantic right whales, it's pretty specific to kind of this time of year, you know, March and April would be more common. Humpbacks, I feel like I've even seen them in the summer, you know, and it, it seems to be the juveniles that like go through, like they just do what they want, you know. <laughs> You're like, okay, yeah. Is that the one that uh, breakwater open to the public for hiking? Um, this this area right here. Yeah. Um, if you get a boat to it, yeah, but it's private land to get to it. 
and the abutters are very protective of their private land. So um, it's beautiful out here, but you'd almost have to come in by boat from this side because um, it's, it's private on the way too. Yeah, anything else? Good okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, are there any um, protocols that would prevent happening what happened recently with the accident that a ship that lodge going through a waterway could go un, um, unattended and could move in that fashion? Or did they have all of that in place and they were unable to prevent the accident? Do we have measures here that ensure that that would not happen? That there, you know, the car carriers, these ships that are obliged uh, Sure, sure. create um, yeah, so for our bridges, one difference is that our piers are not in the navigation channel. So at low tide, I mean, you, they're out of the water. So I, it's something really large would ground before making contact with the piers. Like down in Baltimore, here in the canal, all large traffic are required to have a, a pilot specific with specific knowledge to our area taking the vessel through. Um, the only vessels that I know of that have the requirement to be escorted by like a tugboat through are the tug and barge units carrying over a certain volume of petroleum. When they are loaded, you will see a second tugboat kind of tailing behind. And they are there just in case something goes wrong with the tugboat attached to the loaded barge so they can respond immediately. And that came out of uh, that's a state requirement, and that resulted after the oil spill in Buzzards Bay in 2003. So those are, those are the protocol that I can think of that, that we have. But um, again, our piers are not in the navigation channel, so it's, it's a little bit different here. About the structures of the, uh, of the roadway bridges, which have the large straw pilings at the base of them, mm -hmm. right on, um, on the uh, perimeter of the sidelines of mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. canal, if they were to be struck, a ship would come through there. I'm yeah. sure that would compromise all of the cars that were above, if you know what I mean, at the very uh, For the railroad bridge? Or the, the highway? The, hi the highway, yeah, the highway bridges. So, like the piers, let me see if I have any photographs. Very large concrete structures yeah. as you walk on the scenic road. Oh. Yeah. All right, so, yeah, so what we have like here, those piers, even though they're wet here, the, the, the surface water, like the canal, the, the, the banks kind of slope down like this. So where it's deep is inside here. Like this, this is 550 feet across, and our channel is 480. So the piers are really, they're wet here, but they're not really in the navigation channel. Like they'll hit ground before they hit the pier. Does that make sense? So the ship would run aground actually mm -hmm. before it would mm -hmm. right. yeah. it out. What if, what if a vessel lost power in the canal and the current was really strong? Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so they they could ground. Yeah. But they could twist too, right? They could. They and could. Then if they twisted, coming into the bridge. That's yeah, but they would probably ground before they hit the. They would ground before they hit the bridge. So they might block the navigation channel. Okay. Yeah. And the last time we had a severe accident in the canal was. Um, 1983, there was a tugboat pulling a barge, and the barge overtook the tugboat and tripped the tugboat. Tugboat sank, the barge snapped free. Fortunately, response was great. You know, the people on the tugboat, I mean, that tug sank fast, but they were able to get up to the elevated wheelhouse, which remained above the surface of the water. So they were rescued off. And then the barge, patrol boats, I think, were able to get out and just kind of nudge it enough to have a soft landing, you know, versus like smashing into rocks or anything yeah. like that. Um, so the, um, and that was, that was a uh, Bouchard, um, 19, so some of, some of you are familiar. And so that tugboat sat on the bottom of the canal for a little bit before they were able to get that back up. Um, but the bridges themselves, like, you know, it, vessels could ground if there was an issue. 
but they wouldn't like take out, the, the bridge is not in the navigation channel. Um, I'll stick around if anyone else has anything else they want to talk about. If you think of it later, come visit me at the Visitor's Center. Anyway, thank you.